ways are so far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end, forever. You and I will be in heaven or hell, period. God did not make death, and he does not delight in the death of the living, for he has created all things that they may have life. God created man for incorruption and made him in the image of his own eternity. But through the devil's envy, death entered the world. And those who belong to his party experience it. God's essence, his nature, is to exist. That is a statement from Christian philosophy and theology. God's very essence is to exist. How do I know that? God said so. Do you remember what God said to Moses from the burning bush? I am who am. Go tell the Israelites, I am sent you. The verb to be. Existence. God's very essence is to exist. God is. I am. Eternally, God is. All life comes from the one who is life itself. And so we can say without any hesitation, human life is sacred. Why is human life sacred? Because it comes from God, who is holiness itself. You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, Jesus tells us. He tells us we have to actualize our potential. But we are born in the image and likeness of God, the sanctity of human life. From the moment of conception to the last moment of natural life and all points in between, human life is sacred. In the beginning... God created all that is and declared it to be good, very good. He created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them in his own image. And when he had finished the work of creation, God exclaimed, it is good, very good. Life is good. Life is sacred. We have to be a people of life and a people for life. That is one of the distinguishing characteristics of the people of God. We are a people of life and for life because life is sacred. Moment of conception, last moment of natural life and all points in between. That's Genesis 1 and 2. Then Genesis 3, the serpent, who was the most clever, the most subtle of all that the Lord God had created. And he came to Eve, the mother of all the living. That's what Eve means, the mother of all the living. And the serpent says to Eve, Did God say you cannot partake of the trees in the garden? And Eve says, Well, no. God said we may partake of all the trees in the garden. Human freedom is very broad. However, God said we may not partake of the tree in the center of the garden or even touch it lest we die. Human freedom has limits. And the limits are laid down by God. God alone 
knows what's good and evil for his creation. But the serpent responded, Surely you do not believe God. The one that Jesus would call the father of lies and murderer from the beginning. Murderer from the beginning. And note the connection between lies and murder. Liar and the father of lies, a murderer from the beginning. He says, God is a liar. No, God just doesn't want you to be like him. Because he knows if you partake of that forbidden fruit, your eyes will be open. And you will become like gods, knowing good and evil. In other words, deciding subjectively and arbitrarily what is good and what is evil. In other words, you play God. You decide when life begins and you decide when life ends. Whose work is that? That's God's work. Who decides ultimately when life begins? God. He's the author of life. And who ultimately decides when life shall cease? God. You know, a couple weeks ago, <clears throat> I didn't know. I, might, I thought, hey, I might die. None of my business. You know, I've got to do my part. I've got to be a good steward of God's work and gifts. Well, you know, if I'm sick, I go to the doctor. I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure anymore. <laughs> but, no, I do. I, I, you know, if you're sick, you go to the doctor. You have to. That's prudence. You have to do that. But we, after you've done everything you can, you take your medicine, you know, you do what the doctor says, you know, like me, I have a, he said, okay, look, just, you got to lower your cholesterol a little bit, watch what you eat, exercise, so if I've got any sense at all, I'll do that, and I, and I will, I am, but after I've done everything I can do, I've got to abandon it, I've got to trust God, I said, okay, I've done my part, he'll do his. When life begins and when life ends is God's business, not mine. Uh, my life may be required from me later this evening. <clears throat> I'm not God. I cannot decide ultimately when life begins or when life ends. But you see, the liar and father of lies and murderer from the beginning wants you to play God. Well, how do you play God? Well, how about artificial contraception? Playing God. You're deciding when life begins or doesn't. That's God's province. That's his business. How about abortion? Playing God? You bet. Deciding when life ends. Suicide. Playing God? Yes, although we understand that people can be very distressed. And we trust in God's mercy. Murder. Playing God? Sure. Terminating a life. That's, by the way, what terminating a pregnancy is. Watch out for verbal engineering. Right? Terminating a pregnancy, that sounds relatively benign. A lot safer than murder. And I'm not saying that the poor women who have abortions are necessarily murderers. I'm not saying that. Because a lot of them are, they don't know really what they're doing. A lot of them are scared, confused. But the act, objectively, is taking the life of an innocent. That's what it is. Regardless of intent, that's what it is in the objective order. Playing God. That's God's business. You can't play God. Genocide. Mass 
Huge numbers of people exterminated for this reason or that. Euthanasia. Hmm? The very word in Greek, merciful death. Merciful indeed. Oh, they have, again, good intentions. It is a case of confusing soft-heartedness with soft-headedness. I don't like to see any human being suffer. I don't. And the older I get, the less I can put up with it, the less I can endure it. The older I get, the more sensitive I become. When I was young, I was a pretty tough character, pretty hardened. The older I get, the softer I get. You know, I, I, I just, you, you become sensitized to human suffering. I just don't like to see any human being suffer. I don't like to see an animal suffer. And the older I get, the more that sensitivity grows. However, I can't play God in a misguided attempt to determine when life ends. For whatever reason, I'm not God. Hence, I have to leave that to God. As I have said so many times before, and you've heard it, we are at war. And we have a war between the forces of life and the forces of death. We have a war that is prefigured in that first book of the Bible, Genesis. After the devil seduces Eve, ah, you can be like gods. If only you will disobey God, you will become like gods, deciding subjectively and arbitrarily what's good and what's evil. Eve bought the lie. What happened? What resulted? Death. God had told Adam and Eve, if you partake of that fruit of the tree in the center of the garden, the tr the, that's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or even touch it, you will die. She bought into the lie. The liar and father of lies presented the lie. She bit into it sank her teeth into it, what happened? Precisely what God said would happen. Death entered the universe. Pain and suffering entered the universe. From that moment on. As the Book of Wisdom says, God did not make death. And he does not delight in the death of the living. For he has created all things that they might exist. Where did death come from? It came from that original sin. Pride. I can be like God. Disobedience. Partake of the forbidden fruit. Consequences? Death. Death. That's the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. And it's been played out ever since. And our generation, like every other generation, experiences the works of death. But our generation, unlike any other generation, has become more astute in effecting and promulgating the works of death. Our generation has become technologically competent in bringing about a reign of death. We have a death wish. We have a culture of death from the moment of conception to the last moment of natural life, culture of death, artificial contraception, abortion, suicide, murder, 
genocide, euthanasia from beginning to end, from A to Z, from first to last, from infancy, from zygote on, death holds sway in the culture of death. And what is the antidote? What's the answer? Life. Life is the antidote for death. And that is why God, the eternal word, became man and dwelt among us. Jesus assumed a human nature, the one who is existence itself, the one who is life itself, assumed a human nature to endow that nature with the power to overturn the works of death. That's the work of the Savior. That's the work of the family. That's the work of the Christian. That's your work. That's my work. And make no mistake about it, we got our work cut out for us. We are in a struggle, a life and death struggle. And with each passing day, the struggle becomes more violent and more evident. Let those who have eyes see. Let those who have ears hear. With each passing day, the works of death and corruption become more evident. How many abortions do you need to see it? How many Enrons and Worldcoms do you need to believe it? How many scandals do you need? to understand that the works of death are very much in evidence in our society and in our world. The sanctity of human life. What's our place in it all? What do we do? How do we do it? How does it affect the family? Well, the family, the garden of holiness, is a garden of life. The same God who is holiness itself is life itself. The same God in whose image we are created is the one who endows us with grace. That's what allows us to do his work. That same God endows us with life and the power to do something in this battle between the forces of life and death. Jesus then turned to the Jews who had believed in him. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They argued with the men. They said, oh, we're disciples of Abraham. We've never been in bondage to anyone. What do you call Egypt? They were in bondage to Egypt. Well, they lied. We've never been in bondage to anyone. Descendants of Abraham, oh, yeah, right. If you were descendants of Abraham, you wouldn't be trying to kill me right now. Why can you not understand what I say? I'll tell you why. You can't understand what I say. You can't bear to hear my word because you are not of God. Boy, Jesus is talking to the religious leaders of his day, the Pharisees. And he's saying, you're not of God. Can you imagine how much gall Jesus had? Can you imagine how, how the, oh, the guts, the moral backbone? Well, of course, he had divine strength, and his, 
in his human nature was filled with the power from his union with divinity. He's, he's truly God as well as truly human. But grace is what helps us to be like him. But imagine that, unprecedented. He stood before the, all the religious leaders and says, you're not of God. You're of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer. Murderer. What's a murderer do? Takes life. Kills. Your father was a murderer from the beginning. He has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies, a murderer from the beginning. Note the connection between truth and life. Note the connection between lies and death. We live in a culture of death because we have countenanced and tolerated a culture of lies. We have been confused and duped. We have been seduced by the wordsmiths. Jesus said, say yes when you mean yes, and no when you mean no. Many of the wordsmiths and pseudo-scholars would have you believe that there is no black and white, that everything is gray, that the truth and lies are not so clearly defined, that there are no moral absolutes. They would have you believe that. They are liars. The spawn of the father of lies. And the results of their work is death. Lies beget death. What is the genesis, the origin of the culture of death? Lies. Lies. The lie that it is not really a human being in the womb. I once was in, I will use a polite term, I was once in a debate. I could call it a dog fight, but I won't. I was once in a debate with a radical feminist, a Catholic, nun, <laughs> radical feminist, who supported a woman's right to an abortion. Oh, there are many Catholics, maybe a majority, who believe a woman has a right to artificially contracept and who even has a right, under certain circumstances, some might say, for an abortion. No such thing. Can you be Catholic and hold those positions? No, you can. Can you be Catholic and hold the position that if it's in accord with your conscience, you can take the birth control pill, use condoms, or even have an abortion. No. What conscience? Well-formed conscience, malformed conscience, dead conscience. No such thing as conscience in a vacuum. Conscience has to be formed, and it has to be formed to the objective norm of church teaching, the truth, which is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you think after 2,000 years, and more than that, because back into Jewish history, history of the chosen people, do you think that after all that, now all of a sudden, God changes the rules? Or that we've become so much more enlightened now, that now truth is a lie and lies are truth? Do you think now all of a sudden, evil has become good? And good evil. That transposition of the poles of reality, 
that turning upside down good and evil, like in Shakespeare when the horrid sisters chanted, fair is foul and foul is fair. That could be the battle cry of the liberal mind today. Good is evil and evil is good. Oh, sexual openness. We have to be tolerant. They say you must be tolerant. Tolerance is a good thing. We must be tolerant. We must be tolerant of all good things. If God created a man black, that's good. If he created him white, that's good. God created him. Got to be good. We've got to be tolerant of the entire spectrum of good. I've got to tolerate every good thing, but I don't have to tolerate evil. There is no such thing. Then you have stepped outside the circumference of the authentic definition of tolerance, and you have entered the realm of permissiveness. And there is a radical and essential difference between tolerance and permissiveness. Tolerance, the acceptance of a wide spectrum of the good. Permissiveness, you cross the line. When I begin to accept evil, that's not tolerance, that's permissiveness. And that act in itself is immoral and begins to facilitate and enable evil. I become a collaborator in evil. Those who think they are enlightened, far-sighted, up-to-date, progressive, who promote alternative lifestyles, who say that a woman has a right to choose. Choose what? It's the only case in all of language that I know of where you don't complete the sentence. A woman has a right to choose. Choose what? Hey, freedom's a good thing. Once again, be careful about definitions. Be careful that the wordsmiths don't seduce you out of the truth into a lie. Freedom's good. They say, oh, you're against freedom. Nope. I am 100% in favor of freedom. Just like I'm 100% in favor of tolerance. I am a tolerant person. I'm not a bigot. I believe men and women all races should be equal, and treated equally, and loved equally. I believe all that. I believe in tolerance. I do not believe in permissiveness. It ushers the way in for a whole host of evils. Freedom, I'm all for it. Authentic freedom. What's freedom? Human freedom, what is that? Being able to do whatever you want to do? No. You say, prove it. Prove it biblically, okay. I just read it from Genesis. You can partake of all the trees in the garden, but you can't touch that one. Freedom. It's very broad, but it has limits. And the limits are laid down by God. Authentic freedom is not being able to do whatever you want to do. It is not. Because if, were, if it were... Before I leave in a couple of hours, I shall steal the best truck in the parking lot. I'm free. It's a free country, isn't it? No, you don't know that you can't do that. That's not freedom. That's license. Aha. Uh -huh. You're very smart. Exactly. And so be careful. Freedom, yes. License, no. A woman has a right to choose. Choose what? Anything she wants? That's license. 
that underlying fallacious presupposition that freedom is the ability to do whatever you want to do. I have a very highly profound theological word for that. Horse manure. <laughs> freedom is not being able to do whatever you want to do. That's license. Where I say, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm a law unto myself. I'm God. Who says that? Satan. Lucifer. The one who brought evil and death into the world through a lie. You become one of his disciples when you become a disciple of lies. You become a protagonist of the culture of death when you buy into the lie and begin to promote things like artificial contraception, abortion, and euthanasia, you become an unwitting accomplice in the works of death. And so many in the church have done, from the simplest layperson to bishops and theologians, some of them have done it. And continue to do it. But the Lord is the Lord. And the day of reckoning is fast approaching. The butt kicking is coming. And is even here as we speak. You don't believe me? Read the headlines. If your conscience doesn't bother you, then perhaps the multi-million dollar legal settlement will. God can effect his designs in a lot of different ways. And if we don't come along peacefully and change our mind and our heart, he'll slap us upside the head with a two-by-four to get our attention. Guess what? That's what's happening. In case you don't know it, that's what's happening. And you know what? Although I am saddened, as you are, at the sight of it, I'm grieved by it. I'm even discouraged by it. I have to say that a certain part of me says, praise the Lord. You know? I mean, how long does it have to take? How, how much anguish? How much corruption? How much sin? You know, we have a tidal wave of sin that's threatening to wash us away. And so the Lord in his mercy, because he loves us, he straightens us out, like a good parent, right? In this conference on the family, we talk about being a good parent. Sometimes a good parent kicks butt. Plain English. Now, in case you are of the new breed who believes you should never correct your children. Now, I am not going to say you got to slap them upside the side of the head. No, that was my generation. <laughs> and I am not promoting that, although I am not necessarily condemning it either. <laughs> That's up to you. But there are probably other ways to do it. But guess what? You better come up with the other way. And the other way better be at least as effective in order to use it. In other words, don't be permissive. Be tolerant. Be intelligent. Be responsible. But don't be permissive. You do not want to stand before God and explain to the Father why one of his children is in hell. Because you were lax, indifferent, or cowardly. The Catholic family that is the guardian and garden of life and holiness. You know, I, I'm not that old, and neither are you, that you can't remember back to when we were young. Now, you remember what it was like. I mean, it, it, might, it might be 80 years ago, 70 years ago, 50 years ago, but you remember. And you remember that there was a big difference, morally speaking, between then and now. 
Now, I love this country. I consider myself a good American, a patriot. I love my country. I really do. But I tell you that my country is still a great country, still the greatest country. But despite our progress, technology, wealth, we've lost a lot. We've progressed technologically and regressed morally in many cases. Every place you look. In the last year, since I was here one year ago, a nation has been shaken to its very foundations, attacked right in the heart of one of the biggest cities in this country, right in the middle of Manhattan. Can you imagine that? I saw it live on television. And Father Flanagan, my superior, was with me. We saw it together. He had been in World War II. He was a Navy SEAL, one of the first. They called him UDT in those days. But that was the beginning of the SEALs. He went in at Normandy first. And he watched it in disbelief and horror. As the towers collapsed. As they hit the Pentagon. The Pentagon? Who'd have thunk it? <laughs> the Pentagon! How do you fly an airplane into that space? We wouldn't have believed that. Not possible. But they did. And Father Flanagan noted with our own planes, with our own planes, with our own planes. That's kind of where it began. The nation was shaken and for a while, to its credit, responded. The lines for confession were longer than they'd been in years. I got on an airplane a couple days after September 11th, and the pilot literally rushed out of the cockpit, embraced me at the door, and said, Boy, am I glad to see you. <laughs> and I said, I'll bet you are. <laughs> the flight attendants came out, same deal. You'd think I was a movie star. <laughs> they were really glad to have a, a, a priest on board. Do you know the first week after September 11th, there wasn't a single abortion in New York City? <laughs> Planned Parenthood had to advertise and do them for free to get business going again. Sometimes it takes an unbelievable tragedy to get us back in touch with reality. You know what? We're back to business as usual. Right back, and it didn't take long either. We've been back to business as usual for quite a while now. Guess what? There's more where that came from. Like a billboard I once saw advertising a Broadway play. I could say this to the world, to the United States. I could say it to the Supreme Court. Say to everybody, your arms are too short to box with God. And don't forget it. You want to fight with God? You want to rebel? Want to play games? He'll slap you silly. Oh, he will. He will. Why? Because he's mean? No. Because he's vengeful? No. Because he's merciful. He's merciful. You can pay me now, or you can pay me later. Like the old oil commercial said. Hmm? You know, the greasy old mechanic said, well, you can pay me now, or you can pay me later. Guess what? Cost more later. So you can do your penance now. You can repent now, or you can, you know, spend a couple thousand years in purgatory, or maybe hell. And that's the bottom line, world. Culture of death, greatest country in the world. We had better wake up, we had better straighten up, and fly right. 
right after September 11th, I began to preach. You know, September 11th, I told you I buried my dad. He had died the previous Friday. I was preaching in Buffalo, New York. And I finished the Friday night session, and then I was going to go back to my hotel. And Tamara, my office manager, was with me. She said, wait a minute, i got to talk to you. And she took me aside and said, your dad passed away. And the people were very understanding. They said, we understand if you want to go home right away, cancel. But, but you know, my, my father wouldn't have liked that. Uh, he was always concerned that I be gainfully employed. So he wouldn't have wanted me to leave the job unfinished and the mission not accomplished. So, of course, we finished the mission. Then I went home. Monday, I flew down. Tuesday, I watched the events of September 11th on television, mostly live. Then I went, walked into a chapel, saw my father's casket. On top of it were two symbols, an American flag, and a crucifix. And immediately I had the thought, Dad had fought in two wars and served two countries. Dad had fought in World War II in the Navy, served his country. Then later in life, he fought in another kind of war, the war of redemptive suffering. In his last seven years of life, he had over 30 surgeries. He was a man acquainted with infirmity. He knew something about pain and suffering. And he did it with dignity. He did it quietly. He did it in holiness. He was a member of what has been called the greatest generation. Some of you are members of that generation. And I began to preach along the lines of what came to me. I, gave, I did the homily and the eulogy at my father's funeral, and I preached about serving two countries, United States, heaven, two wars, two countries. Our real homeland is heaven. Two ways are set before you, O oh man the way of life and the way of death. Therefore, choose life. Choose life. Choose the truth. Be in love with the truth. Be enamored of the truth. Be totally imbued with the truth, that you might radiate the truth, that you might give witness to the truth, that you might live the truth, that you might, if necessary, die for the truth. Be a soldier in the army of life. Be a people of life and a people for life. And wherever the forces of death are at work, take up the battle cry. Battle cry of life. Battle cry of God's people. A holy people. A people of life. From artificial contraception to abortion to murder and mayhem all the way to euthanasia. You've got to fight it. In this great nation, I guarantee you that if more than 60 million Catholics would have lived their faith and been faithful to their faith over the last 30-some years, We'd have a very different country and a very different world. But 75% of Catholics in most places don't even go to Mass on Sunday. They're not receiving the sacraments. They're living in a state of serious sin. A large number of them are engaged in artificial contraception. They have the same mind as the world, the secular world. No different. They are not the salt of the earth, and they are not the light of the world. And so the majority of the world wanders around in darkness. Salt, what's it used for? To preserve? 
Hmm? You preserve food with salt, right? Well, you need the salt of the earth to preserve the world from corruption. Where was the salt at Enron? Where was the salt at Arthur Anderson? Where was the salt at WorldCom? Where's the salt in the medical and legal professions? Where was the salt in the priesthood, in the episcopacy? And Jesus said, if the salt loses its savor, it is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trodden underfoot. And salt is used to give taste. You think we have a tasteless society? It's because the salt of the earth has lost its savor. I don't blame it on the pagans. I don't blame it on those who are running around out in the world living in sin. I don't blame them. I blame us. We have failed to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And so we have gone from bad to worse. And it is not over yet. We need to change. We need to pray. We need to do penance. We need to rededicate ourselves to the works of life. Families have to be beacons of life. The family is the place where life begins. Mom and dad, in their love for each other, in a mutual exchange and expression of their emotional, spiritual love for each other, enter into the creative domain, the sanctuary of God's own creative power, and they procreate. They collaborate with God in the works of life. This is where life begins, and this is where life must be nurtured, and this is where life must be defended in the family, in the family. If the family, if the Catholic family, is just like all the world around it, the neo-pagan world, the corrupt world, the salt has lost its savor. The light is no longer, in fact, light but darkness. And if your light is darkness, how deep, how very deep will the darkness be? families, Catholic families. That is the key to the renewal of society. That is the key to the renewal of our great country. That is the key to the preservation of the very world. And it happens one at a time. Dad, you're a man. Be one. The world around you will criticize you mock you for fulfilling your role. Be a man, first of all. Be a man, a loving man, but a man. Be a husband to your wife. Be a leader. Be the head of the household, not a tyrant. Doesn't mean that. But be a man, a good husband and a good father. Families depend on that. Now, I understand that there are many single-parent households, and I tell you, I grew up in one. And God bless you if it's the mom or the dad who's doing the work, raising the kids. All right. It's not an ideal situation. You make the best of it, and God will bless you. But listen, we've got to restore the integrity and dignity and sanctity of the Catholic family. A failure to do it is a failure indeed. And the very preservation of society and civilization depends upon this. Happens one at a time. Dads, men, be men. Be dads, be husbands. Women, same advice to you. Be strong. 
the Blessed Mother as your example, the great women of the Bible as your example, the Old Testament, Judith, Ruth, great, strong, noble women, God's creation. And together, male and female, that he did indeed create them, husband and wife, united, indissolubly united in the bond of holy matrimony, families, begetting children, families, gardens of life, families, gardens of holiness. Do your part. Do your part. Strengthen and sanctify your families, one at a time. And then when it's over, and I'm going to tell you it's going to be over sooner rather than later for most of us, 50 years is nothing in the context of eternity, and I don't have 50 left. I might have one, I might have 21, I don't know. But I know every minute's precious, and I better get to work, and you too. And so our prayer is for each other, and our prayer is for families, and our prayer is that God will bless us and bring to completion the good work he has already begun. God bless you. God's ways are so far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end, forever. You and I will be in heaven or hell, period. After the serpent had tempted and seduced Eve with the big lie, God said this to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He shall bruise your head and you shall bru bruise his heel. War, enmity. After the original sin, God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman. That's the first book of the Bible. It's called the Proto-Evangelium. That's when, when the war came to a new level. Then the last book of the Bible, book of Revelation, chapter 12. And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was with child, and she cried out in her pangs of birth and anguish for delivery. And then another sign appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems upon his heads. He swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But they were defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. But the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been cast down, who accuses them night and day before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Rejoice then, O heaven, and you that dwell therein. But woe to you, O earth and sea, 
For the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. That time is now, as far as I can see. He knows his time is short. The war. War bro broke out in heaven. The war spilled down onto the earth. The war is going on. It's raging. One of the, one of the enormous strategies or tactics of the enemy in this war and it's a, a battle zone unto itself, is the attack on the family. And so we come to the title of this particular talk, Contemporary Attacks on the Family. And they are many, and you know what many of them are. I'll try to hit the, the low points. I won't say the high points. I'll hit the low points. You know, some of the... Uh, strategies. And I'm going to start, because we are at a, this unique place in history, the attack on the priesthood, as I said last night. You can't imagine what a horrible attack on the family this attack on the priesthood is. And the devil, being a good strategist, has hit us from within as well as from without. Hmm? He, he's hit our brothers playing on their weakness, whatever it might be. Now, everybody has a moral weakness. Everybody. I don't care who you are. You've got a weakness. For some people, it's alcohol. For some people, it's cocaine or heroin, marijuana. For some people, it's sex of this, that, or the other variety. For some people, it's money, greed. Everybody's got a weakness. I don't care who you are. I don't care how good you are. Everybody has a weakness, and the enemy knows it. He'll set you up. <clears throat> He's a tactician. A, a good general might pound a fortified position with airstrikes, artillery to soften it up. Then what does he do after that? Then he sends in the infantry. But he doesn't send them in until he has taken that strategic action of softening them up. Pound them with artillery, airstrikes, so forth. Then and only then do you send in the infantry, the ground troops, to finish up, to clean up the action. Stress. Everybody has stress of one kind or another. It's a real thing. Oh boy, and it is effective. And it'll wear you down. Have you ever noticed that when you are under a great deal of stress, you are pushed toward your area of weakness? Now there are many people in this audience right now who know exactly what I'm talking about. They have been there and done that. You know it and I know it too. I also have been there and done that. After a while though, you never become immune. Okay? Yeah, I don't care how old you are. <clears throat> you know, I've had 90 year old men and women tell me that they're struggling with sins against chastity. And they can't believe it. You know, they're, and they're really upset about it. They're, they're, and, and they're angry about it. Can you believe that? Father, you know, some poor little 90-year-old woman will say, can you believe that, that at my age? And then I always tell them this joke. There was an old monk in the desert back in the days when the, of the Desert Fathers back in the 5th, 4th century, in the deserts of Syria and Egypt, when there are many hermits and anchorites who lived lives of constant prayer and penance in the desert. And the holiest monk in the desert, this old hermit, he was over 100 years old. And he was considered the most holy monk in the desert. A novice came to him one day 
And he said, Father, everybody knows that you're the holiest monk in the desert. So I've, been, I've come to you for advice. Now, I'm just a novice, just starting out. But in my vocation, I'm having terrible temptations against chastity. Could you please tell me, Father, at what age does it go away? And the old man said, looked at him in amazement and said, uh, well, I don't know, my son, but from what they tell me, approximately three days after you're in the ground. <laughs> so don't feel bad if you've got that problem or any other one. You know, welcome to humanity. You know, it doesn't mean you're evil or bad. I don't know what your particular weakness is, but it may be among the ones I mentioned, maybe some other one, whatever it is, you've got one. Now, you may have overcome it, for the most part. Uh, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting, just like you, I'm getting older. I, uh, I am not as agile as I used to be. I am not as fast as I used to be. I cannot run the 100-yard dash in 9.6 seconds, like I could when I was 16 years old. I can't bench press 300 pounds anymore, like I did when I was 14 years old. And I also don't have the problems with hormones that I did when I was 16 years old. Praise the Lord. <laughs> That doesn't mean I'm exempt from all kind of stuff, though. Listen, as long as you're in this body, in this life, you're fair game for the enemy. So whatever your weakness is, don't be discouraged by it, even if it has mastered you. And that can happen. Even if you are temporarily caught in a bondage to it, don't despair. You know, don't lose heart. Uh, don't be discouraged. You're going to get out of it. Pray. Pray your way out of it. It might take a year or 20. <laughs> but don't give up. Keep getting up. You fall down, get up. Repent. Go to confession. You say, yeah, but I keep doing it. Then keep getting up. Keep going to confession. Don't be presumptuous and say, oh, I'll just go to confession. No, that's not what I'm talking about. But have confidence in God's mercy. That's what I'm talking about. Attacks on the family. This attack on the priesthood is one of the major in the war on families. Why? It's common sense. Strike the shepherd, scatter the sheep. Now, I told you that the family is a garden of holiness. The family is to be a garden of life, where life is begotten, where life is nurtured, where life is nourished and made fruitful. The priest has the mission of helping you toward that end. He's not better than you, but he's different than you. My vocation is not your vocation, and yours isn't mine. And, I'm, and mine's no better than yours, and yours is no better than mine. Okay? We are not, we're equal in dignity, but we're not the same. But I need you, and you need me. And so we come to this particular battlefront. You take the beast, you take the strain on the lay people, on families. Who's going to help to sanctify your family? Sanctification comes mainly from the sacraments. Five of the seven sacraments require a validly ordained priest. Only baptism and matrimony don't require a validly ordained priest. Little by little, we're taking them out. The devil's taking them out. One by one. I have tried to strike a balance in dealing with this. I, I talked about it during Lent when all the scandals were going full force and the media was in a kind of feeding frenzy. Just 
feeding off these horrible scandals. They seemed to be breaking every week, didn't they? One after the next. You, you were, I was afraid to get up in the morning. You know, I didn't want to, I watched CNN, you know. And I got afraid, so I didn't want to touch the button, you know. What's next? And then it kind of died down for a while, and last week my mother called me. And then she sends me the, the newspaper clipping. Seven priests removed from ministry forever. I know some of these men. I know them personally. Some of these men were very instrumental in helping my vocation along. I never had a clue that any of them had a problem, a moral problem. And the fact of the matter is none of them did when I knew them. 25 to 35 years ago, that's before my time, before my vocation. 25 to 35 years ago, when they were all younger, more vulnerable, more attacked perhaps, when they had all those things working against them, they weren't vigilant. We went through a time in history in the world and in the church back in the 70s, We weren't vigilant. We, we got caught napping. It's easy to blame a bishop for everything, and you can't do that, and they got the toughest job in the world, so I don't want to do that, but I'll do it anyway. <laughs> like permissive parents. Got caught napping. You know what a permissive parent is like? <clears throat> They're not vigilant. Not vigilant. You know, you let your kids go off with older kids, maybe. Go to a certain party. Dress a certain way. And then something happens, and you wonder why. And my question to you is, why are you wondering? I know one group ostensibly good Catholic family, quite affluent. Good people, nice people. I like them. They had a really good-looking daughter, about 14 years old. Now, she wanted to dress the way the fashion dictated, which was well, I'll tell you what, it was no different than your average street prostitute in Los Angeles or New York would dress. Your average street hooker would dress just like that. So she did. And she began to go to parties. And the parents didn't supervise the parties, and she began to do drugs. And she began to engage in promiscuous behavior. And then she got busted at a party, high on cocaine, naked with another group of men and women, boys and girls. And the police reported in detail what they saw when they broke into that room. And mom and dad said, oh, how could it be? How stupid can you be? You ask for it, you get it. And I'm talking about the parents, not the kids. And that's what some of the bishops were like, permissive parents. There was permissive moral theology there was an attitude of live and let live, tolerate, don't judge. Once again, watch out for the wordsmiths. Judge not lest you be judged. Amen, I say. Amen to that. But there is a radical difference between judgment and condemnation. 
The real meaning of the scripture is condemn not lest you be condemned. I don't know all the circumstances. I don't know why you are the way you are. And so I can't condemn you. But I have to make a judgment in the moral order. If in the objective order you are engaged in objectively immoral behavior, I can say that is immoral behavior. Am I judging you? No. I'm making an objective judgment, but not a condemnation. Condemn not. You, you have to understand the difference in these terms. They're subtle differences, but the serpent is the most subtle of all the creatures the Lord God had created. And so beware. You've got to be vigilant. Now, that attack on the priesthood that we're enduring now, that's one of the most violent and effective attacks on the family that there is. Only demonic intelligence could come up with that one. And what could be worse? God help us. A priest? Children? I, I, in, in my entire life, listen, I have been in the gutter in my life. I can honestly report to you that that has never even entered my mind. In all the years I lived in the gutter on drugs and seeing every kind of immorality imaginable, I mean, I lived out the contemporary battle cry of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I never even, I never thought of that. That was not something that ever entered my mind, thank God. And so I have difficulty fathoming it. But, hey, the devil is smarter than I am. He came up with it. So, some of these poor priests, that's their weakness. That's what they gravitated towards. That's what they did. To what could you do to destroy or undermine confidence that would be worse than that? Hmm? If you can't trust your children, your children, to a priest, who can you trust? Well, the answer is nobody except God, because the enemy has crossed the final threshold now. Because I'll guarantee it, if you have a priest can do it, a physician can do it. A lawyer can do it, a teacher can do it. It's horrible. You can't countenance it. Can't be permitted. And we, we've watched it in the media, okay? So I'm just trying to make a point. I, I don't countenance it. I don't like it. As I said a few weeks ago when I was preaching in my series on the church, I did a series to respond to the scandals. We have it over at the table. It's called Scandal. I said, I'm madder than hell. Excuse the harsh term but it is an accurate term. I am madder than hell and have a right to be because I'm the one who gave up my life to do this. I'm the one who spent 10 years getting an education that is useless for anything other than what I do. I am the one who set aside my whole life. I could have been a really good attorney. If I'd have been a lawyer, watch out. I had several of those multi-million dollar checks framed on my office wall. Matter of fact, I got one of the highest scores on the LSATs the year I graduated from college and was accepted at four really big law schools and almost went. I didn't in the end. I became a priest. Now. This mess aggravates me way worse than most people because I'm one of them. Oh, I haven't committed those sins, but I'm a priest, and I take the fallout. That day that I finished that 
mission, that retreat during Lent in St. Louis. I told you about it, how the priest came to the airport and asked me to talk about it and so forth. I went to the airport. I was waiting for my flight, and there was a, a woman with her child. The child was playing on the floor, like you often see. You spend as much time in airports as I do. You, know, you see that quite a bit, common sight. And it was a cute kid. I don't know how old, a year, year and a half. And the, the baby smiled at me. And I smile back at the child, normal thing to do. And that mom snatched up that kid so fast and gave me a look, you know, like the mother lion. Don't you even think of coming close to my child and, and stormed off. Now, she didn't have to give me a verbal explanation of what was going through her mind. I was dressed like this. Do you have any idea what that does to us? I don't have a family and never will. I don't have a wife and don't have children and never will. I have a family in a sense I have, in a sense, adopted child and adopted spiritual children. But I am afraid, and you know, I am not really a timid person. It's pretty difficult to spook me. I mean, you really got to go some. I don't scare. You can't really intimidate me because I'll spit in your eye. I'm, I, I mean it. I don't, I just, it's just not, a, that's not in my vocabulary. However, that being said, I got to think about being too chummy with any man, woman, or child. Because as I told you before, if you have a friend who is, is a man, they're going to say you're a homosexual. If you have a woman who's your friend or close to you in a, in a pure way, a chaste way, a good way, they're going to say, must be his mistress, must be something going on there, and then God forbid that a priest is close to a child. We all are now thinking about it, and don't be surprised if we don't hug the children anymore. And that is a tragedy for me, for us, and for you. That is an attack on the family. How can you feel comfortable to approach us, to talk to us in confession or spiritual direction? How can we feel comfortable? Years ago, when this stuff was starting, our superior said, you can no longer be in a room with a woman. You cannot hear a woman's confession in a, in a reconciliation room. You must do it in a confessional with witnesses outside. And the logic would be you can't do it with a man either. And, you know, anybody who just says, well, the woman's nuts. Because we got more problems on the other side. You know? Uh, and, and with a child, you'd think, well, at least that should be exempt. Nope. Most of all with that. So where are we now? You can't. You, you've got, you're impeded. You're afraid to approach us, and we're afraid to approach you. And that stinks. That's an attack on the family. Number one. Then I have what I might term the attack of the P-Squad. P-Squad? Yeah. Permissiveness. Promiscuity. Potions. Pornography prostitution and progressivism, the attack of the P-Squad. Permissiveness, permissive attitude, you're okay, I'm okay. You know, don't judge anybody, you know. If they want to go 
to that immoral place and do that immoral thing, ah! You know, if the, if the priest wants to go on vacation to the nude beach, as some lay people once in a certain diocese gave me a dossier this thick on their bishop, they had hired a private detective to follow him around. And I didn't want that. I'm not interested. But for some reason, this person thought I should have a copy of that. They had also sent a copy of it to the Vatican. And that bishop was shown in many uncompromising situations. And all the articles that he'd remit, uh, written over the years, and all the dignity masses for homosexuals that he had hosted in the cathedral, it was all there in that loose leaf binder. I did not want to see it. Permissiveness. Promiscuity. You know, in the 60s, it started with so-called free love. It started a long time before that. It started in the Garden of Eden is where it started with the fall. But in the 60s, we had an escalation of rebellion. I got to be free. I got to be me. And in very subtle and sometimes not so subtle ways, sex became a sport. Really? My sport. That's all. Let's play tennis. And that's about it. With not much more seriousness than that. Promiscuity. Once you sever the link or cross the line where the sanctity or the sanctuary of marriage, once that is no longer the only place that is morally permissible, then it's open season. Then you name it. Promiscuity. What is one of the things that fostered promiscuity more than anything? Artificial contraception. You know, if I'm an immoral person, as I was much of my life, and I didn't have to worry about Susie Q getting pregnant, let the games begin. Let the party begin. And that has done more to break down society and foster promiscuity than anything else in history. And Pope Paul VI prophetically predicted the effects of it. And we are now living through those effects. We have them. The breakdown of the family. An artificially contracepted marital act is a statement in the language of the body. Okay, we got married. We vowed to each other. I am yours and you are mine forever. All that I am and all that I do I give to you. We, the two have become one flesh. Then, at the most intimate moment, when the two together are able to enter into the sanctuary of God's creative power, in the language of the body, they say, Nope! You can't come any closer. Yeah, I'm yours, except not that way. Nope. The two of us can't go together into God's sanctuary of procreation. I love you, but not that much. I'm yours, but not totally. In the language of the body, it is a statement of rejection. And it is a very interesting... Con oh, I don't know, I don't want to... We'll call it a uh, coincidence. It is a very interesting coincidence that the divorce rate in this country is almost exactly the same as the percentage of people using artificial contraception. And I guarantee you, if you do it, you're asking to go your separate ways. Oh, you don't do that consciously. You don't say that. 
Uh, uh, oh, well, I know this, you know, we're going to break up because of this. No, you don't do that. You have, you have good intentions, perhaps. Sounds good. But what happens? In the language of the body, at the su in the subconscious level, you're saying, nope, rejection. It registers as rejection at the level of the subconscious. No, stop. And over time, that rejection will result in a drifting apart. Infidelity. Pornography. One of the P-Squad. It has flourished. It is a multi-billion dollar industry. Under the specious pretext of freedom of expression, and it isn't freedom, it's license, the moronic, misguided interpreters of the Constitution, often called Supreme Court justices, have, they've confused freedom and license. It is licentious. Pornography brings a host of evils into society, and it is a very seductive, very, very strong, destructive force. There are every bit as many people addicted to pornography today as are addicted to heroin, cocaine, and alcohol. And it is no longer relegated to some backstreet dive. You can get it right in your living room, right in your office, right on your computer. Compliments of the Internet. Anytime, any place you like. The pornography guys, they were the first ones to make millions off the Internet. They were the first ones to recognize its potential. They were the first ones to set up websites that made money. The P Squad. Permissiveness, promiscuity, pornography. Potions. Did you know that in most of the pagan religions, uh, especially many in ancient Greece, they had, as part of their religion observance, observance, orgies always coupled with potions. It's a dimension of witchcraft and sorcery. Now, those of us who've been around in recent days we reckon, I don't even have to finish the sentence. But you know what I'm talking about. Potion, drugs. Drugs. Twenty-five years ago, in Hollywood, rock music, cocaine, orgies, pornography. It all went together. And almost never was it separated. People began to look forward. It became a focal point of their life to get high, watch pornography, and do things they never would have imagined they could have ever done before. And millions have fallen into it. And the ranks of lesbians and homosexuals has grown exponentially because of it, under the specious pretext of freedom. The Peace Squad, permissiveness, promiscuity, pornography, por uh, potions, drugs, prostitution. Many, many, many prostitutes are caught. They are not evil. They get caught in bad situations. I do not judge and condemn them in any way. I, in a sense, remember Mary Magdalene. 
the biggest prostitute in Palestine, who had seven devils cast out of her, and became the best friend of Jesus Christ. Who was the first one to see the risen Lord, according to Scripture? Mary Magdalene was. Must have been a real good friend of the Lord's. Oh, this man eats with sinners, the Pharisees said. That's right. I've come for sinners, not the self-righteous. But prostitution is a degradation of the human person whose author is Satan. Women or men, and by the way, there are an increasing number of male prostitutes, in, in case you don't know that. They lose their sense of self-worth, their dignity. I once saw a 14-year-old girl dead in a garbage can in Hollywood. She was a prostitute heroin addict. Years later, I thought about that and realized Satan wants our children dead in a garbage can. And the demise of the family is the way to do it. The P Squad. Permissiveness, promiscuity, pornography, potions, prostitution. By the way, prostitution takes many forms, not the least of which is, as some of my friends call, some women, Las Vegas ladies. Do you know what a Las Vegas lady is? It is a woman who makes a profession of enhancing her financial stature through marriage. I had a girlfriend in Las Vegas in 1974, five, who's been married seven times. When I knew her, she didn't have any money. Her net worth is about 12 million today. Guess how she got it? That's prostitution. She never did anything that she didn't have an eye on money. Takes all kinds of forms. You know, you sell yourself, your self-worth, your dignity, for money. We can prostitute ourselves in all kinds of ways. I'm tempted to prostitute myself. Yeah, for money. Happens. Think about it. You know, I'm an entrepreneur. Do you know that? I've never gotten a nickel from the institutional church, from the day I was ordained. I've never been paid a paycheck. I've never received a benefit. No health insurance. No retirement fund. No paycheck. Ever. The church supports me because you support me. So I'm supported by the church. I am. But I never got anything from the institutional church. So in a way, I'm forced to be an entrepreneur. Which isn't the, uh, it's okay with me. I can do it. I'm good at it. <laughs> but uh, it's not necessarily the best thing in the world for a priest. And so I have temptation. Right? I got to deal with them. And so you can prostitute yourself for power. You can prostitute yourself for money. You can prostitute yourself for what other people think. All kind of ways to do it. Progressivism. We think we're advanced. We think we're so much better than all the generations that went before us. We're progressive in our thinking. Progressive in our moral thinking. We fancy ourselves progressivists when we are permissive. When we are promiscuous. When we engage in social 
drinking and drugging. That doesn't mean that having a drink socially is, is sin. No, it's not. Jesus changed water into wine, and he wouldn't have done it if it was intrinsically evil. So I'm not saying that. But I'm saying it's easy to cross the line if you're not careful. So the Peace Squad, that's an attack, a contemporary attack on the family. The attack of the Peace Squad. Permissiveness, promiscuity, potions, pornography, prostitution, and progressivism. Homosexuality, alternative, so-called alter, alternative lifestyles. Whenever I have talked about this, someone always misunderstands me, even though I do take great pains to try to clarify what I'm saying. And I always begin by saying, look, we are called to love all people. You know, you, you can't hate any class of persons. Everyone is to be loved as God loves them. A person may have a particularly loathsome to you habit, persuasion, be in a certain class, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe ethnics. You know, when I was a kid, it wasn't fashionable yet to be Italian. It wasn't. I remember being called, you know, those names, you know, der derogatory names, you know, when I was a little kid. And it kind of hurt me. And Irish people were discriminated against. You know, the Irish came in my home area in upstate New York. <clears throat> it was settled by the Dutch and the English, Protestant. And then in the 1850s, the Irish came. And they were persecuted by the Protestants, Christians. And then the Italians came, and lo and behold, the Irish persecuted the Italians. And then the Polish came, and lo and behold, the Poles were persecuted by the Italians and the Irish. And then the Hispanics came, and the Hispanics were looked down upon by the Poles, the Italians, and the Irish, and everybody. Now, I think we're getting better. I think there's less of that kind of thing. But we've got to be careful. We don't want to look down. We don't want to be derisive. We don't want to be hateful. We don't want to be bigoted. For whatever reason, a person has that sexual orientation toward a person of the same sex, we don't quite understand it yet. It may be a variety of environmental and societal things it may even have a genetic component. I don't know. But you want to know what I tell gay people? And I don't hate them. Many of them are very creative, sensitive, beautiful people. I'm not homophobic at all. I'm not afraid of them. I say, you know what? You're just like me. You know? No, 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 <laughs> not that way. You're just like me because like me, you're called to celibacy. Uh-huh. That's right. That's the answer for whatever reason you are the way you are, and I sympathize with you being the, that you, you are the way you are. It must be tough. It must be tough. But if you are in fact that way, then you are called to celibacy, just like me. I'm human. You know, there are days when I might be tempted to this, that, or the other thing. I'm called to celibacy. And I don't question it, and I don't doubt it. I know it. And may I die having been faithful to it all the days of my priestly life. I don't mess with that. That's a fact. And I tell them, same for you, until you can resolve that, or maybe you never will, you're called to be celibate. That's an attack on the family. 
this nonsense of giving legal recognition to same-sex partners is a terrible contemporary attack on the family. It will undermine society, and society will go from bad to worse, and it will unravel, it will crash, and it will burn. Radical feminism is a contemporary attack on society. Now, authentic feminism isn't bad, it's good. I am, in a sense, a feminist, meaning that I'm pro-woman. I am. I believe that women should have the same rights as men, absolutely equal in dignity. Hey, if you're a doctor and you're a woman, you should get paid the same as a, as a man. If you're a lawyer, if you're this, that, or the other thing, equal, equal rights, equal recognition, equal dignity, no question. I'm a feminist in that sense. But I recognize that equality and dignity is the not, not the same thing as sameness. Men, men and women are not alike. Physically, emotionally, even spiritually. They're different. And the differences run so deep. That's the topic of a whole other conference. And all the married people can give it. <laughs> right? You're experts on that. You know, you're not the same. And you know it. Consumerism. That's a threat, an attack on the family. You know, money becomes God. It becomes an idol. And you spend all your time trying to generate wealth. We all go off, and there's no unity. Nobody eats dinner at home together. I'll tell you what, if I were the father of a family... Of course, they'd probably nickname me Der Fuhrer, <laughs> but I'd have to be the boss, and we'd eat together. I don't care. Well, we got soccer practice. Tough. Wouldn't be any soccer. If it separates the family, it would not be. Then you work around it. Then dinner will be earlier or later, but it'll be together. Eat together and pray together. At least do that much. Now, I'm not saying kids can't have no activities. They need activities. But don't let it destroy the family. Activism, running here, there, and everywhere. No unity. So what happens? Family falls apart, you know? Family that prays together stays together. I could extend and say family that eats together stays together. You know, I, I'm, still, I'm old enough that, you know, my family ate together. Dinner, at least, you know. On Sundays, the whole family got together at my grandmother's house. You know, we'd have 30 people in the house every Sunday, all holidays. I really pity people who don't have that. I was lucky to grow up that way. But a lot of kids today don't know anything about that. Contemporary attack on the family. The best defense for the family is the family. If you want to strengthen families, strengthen yours. Strengthen yours. Pray together, but you say they won't. They won't. Then you start praying and doing penance. Go before the Blessed Sacrament. Fast. Pray the Rosary. Do everything you can. And don't be, as some of my Jewish friends say, don't be a nudge. You know what a nudge is? Yeah. That, that's, that's someone who tortures everybody around them. You know? <laughs> don't do that. You, you can attract more flies with honey than vinegar. Okay? The power of love is magnetic. There are indeed many attacks on the Catholic family and the family in general. 
And the way to overcome a spiritual malaise, and this is a spiritual sickness, this is a spiritual battle, and the only way you can win it is through spiritual means, prayer. Pray the rosary and go to Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Be close to Our Lady and list the power of the holy angels. Do all those things that you know you ought to do. But sometimes we're too busy. But if you're too busy, your family will fall apart. We live in a much more toxic environment than when we were young. We live in a much more morally toxic environment than when we were young. And if you could get away with taking shortcuts 40 years ago, you can't today. You might have gotten away with your family intact decades ago, but not today. You won't make it. Mom will go her way, dad will go his way, and the children will go each one of their respective ways. And rarely will they ever see each other again. In my own family, which was good in the beginning, which was close, I haven't seen a relative in years. After my grandmother passed away, everybody started to drift. They didn't eat together anymore on Sunday. Then they didn't get together anymore on holidays. And now each one is off in his own little corner, isolated and quite empty. These attacks on the family are attacks on society. These attacks on the family are attacks on civilization, on our country. These attacks on the family are attacks on creation itself. And the author and mastermind of these attacks is the devil himself. He hates life. He hates the family because it mirrors the family of the Most Holy Trinity. So let's do our part. Let's strengthen our families. And in so doing, we'll sanctify the world. God bless you.